in there uh, between then. Um, my educational background is in biology, chemistry, and biotechnology. Um, so from scientific perspectives, I'm, I'm typically able to, to follow pretty closely, um, but I'm still learning a lot of the, the policy aspects. And so I've been with the congressman almost a year now um, and will likely be going back um, as he transitions to the Senate as well in January. Um, I am originally from North Dakota. I grew up in Oaks, which is in kind of the, the southeast corner of the state. Um, and yeah, then I, I went to Texas for school and now I'm in Washington, D.C., so a little bit of everything. Wow, 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 I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for taking the time today. And Dr. Titus, elaborate. What did I miss on you besides that you just got married and you're still in the honeymoon stage? Oh, congratulations. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, well, it's just been a great pleasure. I've been involved with our uh, public company, Medical Marijuana Incorporated. We're actually America's first publicly traded cannabis company uh -huh. going back to March of 2009. Um, originally, I was just involved as an investor. Over time, the company has transitioned into more of a hemp and CBD company. And as we've made this transition, I've taken on an increasingly large role in the management. Uh, well, today I'm currently the president and CEO of uh, the parent company. We have five divisions that are in nutraceutical sales of hemp-based CBD products, uh, Canaway being our flagship division, growing exponentially not only here in the U.S., but also internationally in Europe. We've just had a grand uh, opening in the uh, European markets and uh, we're doing fabulously well over uh, there. Uh, we'll be probably expanding into Asia and Asian markets uh, coming up uh, this next year, 2019. Uh, we also have two divisions that are in pharmaceutical development of uh, cannabinoid-based uh, medicines. And uh, certainly uh, we've been uh, pioneers in the space, uh, bringing the first hemp CBD products to US and world markets back in the spring of the year 2012. And uh, generally I'm an educator. I I've had a, you know, previous career on Wall Street. Um, I worked there for 11 years as a bond trader and underwriter. Uh, from there, I got into the field of physical therapy and uh, wound up with a PhD degree in British physiotherapeutics. Had a wonderful uh, clinical practice in the Carolinas. I was based there for about 20 years. Uh, but when this opportunity came up in uh, California, particularly to transition into hemp and the CBD arena, I thought this was uh, gonna be one of the greatest uh, innovations in healthcare. Um, you know, really since vitamin C, and uh, certainly we're even eclipsing that, I believe, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to, uh, you know, take part of this, um, you know, real revolution. You know, not all cannabis is psychoactive, and certainly uh, we look forward to educating people, and hopefully this presentation there will just help take people through the process. Excellent. So I think we can just get right into it because like you guys are like superpowers and I'm just the person who lined up the meeting because <laughs> because I believe in educating and it's powerful when people are in the know with what's actually happening and mm -hmm. Um, and but I was brought to CBD because of a family crisis about one year ago on December 20th We actually thought our oldest son. He's 18. We thought that um, he possibly had lymphoma and after that doctor's appointment, I came home that night and I simply Googled natural remedies for lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And CBD, cannabis, cannabidiol, all these things came up. And from a non-pot smoker, like I've never smoked pot, not once in my life. My dad was a Marine. He said, don't do it, I'll kill you. We believed him, so we never did. And, and so here we are um, looking at cannabis and cannabidiol. Long story short, we found out on the 24th, Christmas Eve last year, that he did not have cancer. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, but in that four-day window, I looked at CBD and particularly Medica Medical Marijuana Incorporated and Canaway, the companies that I'm part of, uh, in, in depth to find the best purity, quality, legal product that I could actually give not only to my oldest son, Bo, but to our entire family after I was doing the research. I thought, my goodness, you know, I'm on the news every week here in North Dakota on NBC, and I don't know about this. If I don't know this ab about this endocannabinoid system, I bet the world doesn't know, <laughs> you know? So it, in that moment, I realized that God was calling me to something much greater than anything I had been part of. So that was our launch. I think we uh, ended up joining um, the subsidiary company to Medical Marijuana Inc. It's called Canaway. It's like the company that is the distribution for Met network marketing arm, okay. which going around in small groups and educating people, light and fires everywhere we go. Um, and that, that really happened on December 30th of last year. So it's been an, just an awesome, Awesome adventure, sometimes scary when I'm getting threatened that I might be arrested, a little scary at times, but I told Dr. Stuart Titus, I'm just gonna wear t-shirts that say, I'm not scared. We're helping and impacting too many lives for me to buckle back to fear. So mm -hmm. it's been, and now it's gotten easier with that last week. I mean, the 2018 Farm Bill, I'm like, oh, 
Dr. Titus, I will let you begin this awesome presentation. Um, go. All right. Very, very good. Well, uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's been a tremendous history um, <clears throat> of the uh, medical use of cannabis. Uh, really, uh, some of the uh, ancient uh, transcripts going back to 8,000 years BC, showing various cannabis-based uh, oils, tinctures, preparations being used therapeutically. Uh, their actual written records uh, dating back to about 2700 BC in uh, China, about uh, 2500 BC in Egypt. And uh, certainly uh, this uh, use has been uh, something that's gone on uh, through um, <clears throat> many, many generations. Uh, in fact, in the 1800s, uh, in the early 1900s, sure, next slide, that we have some pictures. Um, here, uh, these cannabis-based uh, tinctures and preparations on a recent trip to Amsterdam, I was able to video and actually uh, photograph some of these ancient, uh, well, I would say ancient, but, uh, you know, maybe a generation or rather a century old. Um, uh, these are cannabis-based uh, preparations of all the large pharmaceuticals uh, wow. at the um, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, companies such as Eli Lilly, Park Davis, all had a variety of different cannabis-based uh, medicines. And it really wasn't until the unfortunate marijuana tax act, perhaps on the next slide, uh, we can see that, that uh, you know, unfortunately uh, brought uh, the demise of uh, cannabis and its uh, use as a, a medicine. This uh, just happened in uh, the U.S. and basically lumped a marijuana, hemp, all into this uh, same category and unfortunately uh, allowed for the removal of cannabis from what we call the U.S. pharmacopoeia. This is a compendium of all various uh, pharmaceutical compounds. Um, but research on the research side, even here in the U.S., uh, continued. And in 1940, uh, Dr. Roger Adams actually first isolated uh, CBD from what he called a red hemp oil. And uh, this uh, led to his isolation patent on CBD. I think I have a picture of that on our next slide that actually this uh, U.S. patent was awarded in 1942. Um, so certainly, uh, research was continuing on these extracts from the cannabis plant or these cannabinoids. Now, the uh, next slide, uh, Dr. Raphael McCoolum has uh, been known as the grandfather of cannabis-based uh, medicine, a famous researcher from Israel, um, with the aid of uh, advanced uh, what we now call nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy technology. He was able to determine the chemical structure of THC as well as CBD. Um, he was really the first to isolate and um, identify the THC molecule. Of course, this is now the psychoactive cannabinoid in uh, cannabis, but uh, uh, now uh, Israel's got a very large uh, research group, uh, Tikam Olam, and they're doing some uh, very interesting things in terms of cannabis and CBD uh, research. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of uh, terms being uh, thrown around, and uh, just to simplify things a little bit, if we look at uh, cannabis potentially as being the parent plant, we might then have two offspring. And on one side, we have hemp, uh, which uh, certainly can be grown around the world for various industrial purposes, and of course can contain the non-psychoactive cannabinoid CBD or cannabidiol. On the other side, we have marijuana, uh, which basically has no industrial use, but uh, generally is grown for its very high concentration of THC, which is the psychoactive component. So this is how the cannabis plant family looks. And uh, for picture uh, purposes here, you can see on the, the left side, the hemp uh, can grow very tall, 10 to 20 feet tall in a very short 90 to 120 day growing se season. Um, generally around the world, it's used for its fiber, used in textile purposes. Although, of course, our neighbor to the north grows hemp for its hemp seed because the hemp seed mm -hmm. is extremely nutritious. And there's a very large import-export business. We're here in the U.S. We import about $600 million annually of various hemp seed products, your hemp wow. seed, hemp seed oil, hemp protein powder. Now, on the other side, marijuana is generally grown short and bushy and um, <clears throat> grown, again, for a high concentration of THC. And really, there is no uh, industrial use. Right. The next slide here, uh, <clears throat> again, hemp food products are fully legal throughout the U.S. Uh, this by federal court ruling in the uh, year 2004, Hemp Industries Association actually had to sue the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, and uh, they won. They were victorious. So hemp food products are now fully legal in the U.S. Any state, you can go buy hemp seed, hemp seed oil, hemp protein powder that actually would contain enough THC. So if you're a military personnel and you start ingesting those products regularly, you would actually fail a drug test. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, these products are sold uh, throughout the U.S. and fully legal. Now, uh, marijuana, on the other hand, I might need to update our slides here because we have 33 U.S. states now, uh, plus Washington, D.C., who've legalized uh, uh, marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, obviously, the numbers keep uh, growing uh, every uh, few months and every year. Uh, certainly, there's a, a much greater acceptance of the medical use of marijuana. We have 17 U.S. states now that approved as CBD forms of uh, marijuana for children to be able to use this uh, product and parents to possess it uh, legally. Um, so marijuana can also be grown for a high concentration of uh, CBD and some companies are doing this. Uh, currently we now have 10 U.S. states that have legalized the recreational use of CBD and uh, rather I'm sorry the recreational use of uh, marijuana. Now, CBD was actually uh, formerly known as the hippie's disappointment, and uh, this uh, occurred basically in the uh, 1960s, the mid-1960s. We had this uh, kind of counterculture revolution, uh, the Beatles, rock and roll music. We had uh, the war in Vietnam, and a lot of uh, uh, cannabis use now became very popular among the younger generation, which was kind of my generation, if you will, uh, back then. But of course, many marijuana growers thought CBD was another um, cannabinoid that could be grown. And so they tried to grow a high concentration of CBD in a marijuana crop. And then when they smoke a marijuana cannabis cigarette, um, basically there was no effect. So CBD became known as the thing, oh, it gives you a headache, and uh, they called it the hippie's disappointment. And this lasted for about 50 years until us, uh, a group of us uh, entrepreneurs, uh, really thought that if we did this a little bit differently, uh, and I think our next slide uh, talks to this a little bit, if we were to um, you know, grow a high concentration CBD in a hemp crop, and it took us four cycles over in Europe to be able to legally do this. We had to develop special harvesters, et cetera, to be able to extract uh, the nice uh, CBD rich uh, hemp oil. We did that, we did our extraction process, and then we developed import export regulations to take the CBD rich hemp oil from Europe into the US, had our final products uh, finished, and uh, then on US and world markets uh, going back to the summer or the spring and summer of the year 2012. So we've been you know, in this uh, business now a good six, six and a half years. It's been phenomenal to see how many people are getting tremendous health and wellness benefits by utilizing uh, CBD. Now, uh, hopefully uh, next week there'll be a vote and uh, hopefully the thumbs up on the U.S. Farm Bill of 2018. This includes significant hemp uh, provisions, and uh, we're uh, very excited about this because hemp will then be legally brought back to the U.S. as an agricultural crop. So it will compete on an equal footing with wheat, corn, soybeans, etc. There'll be a futures contract in Chicago traded for hemp and hemp futures where uh, farmers can offset any of their risk by growing hemp. Uh, we think as much as 60 million acres of U.S. farmland can be grown with hemp. And okay. Certainly uh, could potentially be a multi-billion dollar uh, marketplace because there are a tremendous amount of industrial uses as well as the CBD can be used uh, very, very therapeutically. So uh, certainly- and who, know, who knows if a lot of that might be done in North Dakota because um, Bree, hemp is a bioaccumulator, which means that it attracts things like from the environment. So if it's grown like in a pretty kind of dirty environment, it can be kind of dirty hemp. And so because North Dakota, we're the land of wide open places here, man. We've got some room to plant. Um, who knows, right, Dr. Titus? Maybe something will even, we'll be planting some hemp in ND soon. <laughs> For sure, we're definitely excited about the opportunities. And uh, obviously they grow a tremendous amount of flax in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And we think uh, flax is a very nice cousin of hemp, it should probably be used very, very uh, well in terms of a rotational crop along with flax. Wow. Yeah. Now, um, in terms of the overall cannabis market, of course, uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest uh, throughout the country and uh, THC. We see amazing things happening going on in states such as Colorado, Washington, Oregon, some of the more progressive uh, recreational cannabis states. And through this, we basically extrapolated throughout the U.S. Uh, what the real size of this legal underground uh, market for uh, cannabis is. And we estimate this to be about a $120 billion a year marketplace in the United States. Uh, Forbes magazine next year projects that CBD sales will approach $1.2 billion. Uh, certainly this is a wonderfully growing market, but you can see that CBD only represents about 1% of the entire uh, cannabis pie. 
And wow. uh, certainly uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest. And uh, we think as many of the you know, people who've been using marijuana would tend to uh, see the benefit that all of a sudden you don't necessarily need to get the high to get the health benefits uh, from this. A lot of people will start to uh, transition over. And uh, we really think that CBD uh, will take, a you know, maybe as much in the next slide, I think I show this, uh, 25 to 40% of this overall cannabis market. And thus, you know, we're looking at a possible, uh, you know, 40 to 60 billion dollar opportunity just wow. based on this uh, alone. Now, of course, as cannabis becomes more legal throughout the country, many more people feel like they are able to use it and take advantage of this. We see in the medical cannabis friendly states a tremendous switch people from their traditional pharmaceutical medications over to cannabis because it's helping people to overcome health challenges without the negative side effects or the consequences from traditional pharmaceutical medications. So given these dislocations, we really believe that CBD can represent as much as a hundred million dollar a year annual marketplace, a hundred billion dollar a year marketplace. Now, of course, uh, there are a tremendous amount of benefits uh, to hemp uh, throughout the uh, globe and certainly here in the U.S. when we're able to grow hemp at large enough scale, what we call uh, economies of scale, uh, certainly we're going to see a lot of these amazing industrial applications start to emerge. I think the next slide I show some of these applications, including uh, your clean biofuel from the significant amount of biomass that can be produced. Of course, your hemp textiles, uh, your hemp bioplastics, so all our you know plastic water bottles can now be made from natural biodegradable hemp. Mm -hmm. Our building and construction materials are very, very interesting that hemp is a tremendous insulator. Uh, hemp board, hemp concrete, uh, very interesting technologies that will be uh, much more uh, part of our uh, building construction, particularly here in California next year, uh, yeah. two th well, 2020, it's all mandated that every new construction is going to be carbon negative or carbon neutral. And hemp certainly has a great application there. And then there's a new emerging technology of hemp batteries and hemp supercapacitors. Hemp itself is very electric and is able to store energy. And I think part of the benefit of CBD is really because of the electrical uh, application that it really has on the human body. I always um, say, Dr. Titus, it turns the lights on in the house, in your body. That's <laughs> what really I feel does. like happened to me. I was like, I was like, I was like, Ugh. and then all of a sudden you take CBD and it's just like CBD brain. You're like sharp and your memory's better and you're sleeping better and you're, you can, I mean, it's just incredible what happens when you take CBD. And I, I use that analogy, like it turns the lights on in the house. So that's funny that you say it's electric. I want to start saying that. That's good to know. For sure, it really is. And uh, of course, uh, you know, medical science, um, we always talk about the chemical side because that's where pharmaceuticals are, but really we are electrochemical beings. We don't plug ourselves into the wall at night like our cell phones, but truly when we go to sleep at night, we recharge our electrical energy. There's a whole, you know, uh, uh, electrical circulatory system in the human body, interestingly enough, and by recharging our uh, batteries, uh, we really keep ourselves young, healthy, and um, uh, certainly helps the stem cell activity. Uh, okay. Now, this uh, one slide on the uh, World Health Organization. There have been some great uh, meetings going on here to help uh, deschedule or remove cannabis uh, from what's called the United Nations Single Convention Treaty on Narcotics. Uh, there will actually be a vote of all the uh, United Nations member nations coming up in March of 2019 to actually remove cannabis. Uh, but previously, the World Health Organization has looked at CBD and basically has said that uh, CBD is very safe. It's not going to be a scheduled drug because there's no tendency for addiction. And further, that CBD may be a useful treatment for a number of different uh, medical conditions. So we certainly have links if you're interested to take a look at this. Um, and we, we do see a tremendous amount of publications now looking at uh, cannabis, various forms of cannabis, CBD, marijuana, et cetera. Here in Newsweek, I asked the question, is marijuana the best or the world's best treatment for autism? And it does certainly say that's the plant's CBD portion that relaxes these autism spectrum disorder children. It counters anxiety and makes it very relevant uh, for both epilepsy as well as uh, autism. 
Yeah, so wow. that's interesting. Uh, yeah. The CBD also uh, may soon be used in the emergency room to fight the effects of stroke and cardiac emergencies. CBD yeah. is a tremendous anti-inflammatory. And here's a nice article from Natural News showing how it's uh, becoming a lot more accepted by medical doctors, even in the emergency room and trauma care centers. Wow. Now, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, in terms of cannabinoid science, uh, basically this whole science about the internal endogenous cannabinoid system is a fairly new discovery. About 1988 was the first uh, discovery, and uh, certainly it's not widely taught in medical schools. In fact, medical schools today in the U.S., only one in seven even mentions the endogenous cannabinoid system, much less teaches anything about it. And this certainly is the you know, largest self-regulatory system in the human body. I, uh, certainly excited that you know, uh, this uh, tremendous discovery, it basically is involved in every physiological function that uh, goes on, our mood, sleep, appetite, hormone production, the digestion of food, even metabolism, all fall under the directions of this internal endogenous cannabinoid system. Yeah, and you know, these, these cannabinoids, so what are they? Uh, these are basic extracts or special compounds that are found in the cannabis plant family. Um, currently, there are actually 146 different known and identifiable cannabinoids. Uh, many of our products have about 60 different cannabinoids in various trace proportions, of course, a very high concentration of CBD. Uh, but interestingly, this uh, cannabis, in particular the hemp plant itself, is very chemical rich. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of these chemical compounds, things such as terpenoids, flavonoids, your chlorophyll, plant waxes, etc. And these um, compounds all act synergistically together. Um, so uh, we're, we're really excited about uh, some of the uh, amazing benefits. And uh, of course, it just stands to reason if you have a lot of these, you know, like super vitamins all uh, put into one uh, plant compound and you take the extract and you're able to concentrate it, uh, people are going to get some amazing benefit. But it's also interesting that these cannabinoids can be found in many other plants, echinacea, flax, hops, uh, common tea, kava, etc., and uh, these other chemical compounds called terpenoids, uh, some of these terpenes are what are called essential oils, basically have an amazing uh, therapeutic effect. One of them, beta carophylline, really acts uh, very significantly on the body's endocannabinoid system. Wow. Now, uh, the next slide, I think, is just kind of a picture depiction of what we call all these entourage botanicals, all your cannabinoids, your terpenoids, flavonoids, plant waxes, chlorophyll, and other uh, various uh, proportions. And then uh, the next slide, I talk a little bit more about the endocannabinoid system. Again, I, I previously mentioned this. Again, the largest self regulatory All these tremendous uh, functions, including hormone production, et cetera. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, plant uh, cannabinoids have analogs, or what this means is that in the human body, we do produce our own internal cannabinoids, interestingly enough. So we all have this, and not only us humans, but also all mammalian creatures. So our fishes, dogs, horses, cattle, all have this internal cannabinoid system and respond very, very well to plant-based cannabinoids because these plant cannabinoids basically supplement this large self-regulatory system. Now, our internal cannabinoids, uh, the two of them are widely known. Uh, one is called anandamide. The other one has got a long chemical name. It's abbreviated as 2-AG. Uh, but interestingly enough, these internal cannabinoids are very quickly degraded by normal human, what we call enzymes or enzymatic activity. And it's interesting to note that plant-based cannabinoids are not as quickly degraded, so they have a much longer shelf life in the human body. And again, we have a nice link. A doctor uh, reviews the endocannabinoid system to a very, very good degree. Now, two of the main receptor sites that have been discovered, uh, your CB1 receptor, uh, I think from 1988, widely expressed in the brain and spinal column and the central nervous system. Uh, this has great potential benefit for your neurodegenerative disorders. And then your CB2 receptors are more found in the gut, the viscera, the internal organs. And they have a profound uh, a function to help the body's immune system to stay strong and fight off uh, invaders. Um, so these are two of the main receptor sites. And it's interesting to note that on the next slide, uh, we mentioned that of all the brain's neurotransmitter receptor sites, the CB1 neurotransmitter receptor site is the most widely expressed in the human brain. So uh, certainly these plant cannabinoids 
really belong in our diets. And it's just been a shame that cannabis and these cannabinoids have been now eradicated from our human diets for the past, um, you know, three and a half generations. And right. many of us are what we now call cannabinoid deficient. So besides your CB1 and CB2 receptor sites, uh, we have a tremendous amount of other receptor sites in the human body that accept cannabinoids. This one family, very technically in science, the G-protein coupled receptor sites, interestingly enough, they control the function of about 800 human genes or about 4% of our overall genomic sequence. And thus, we've seen many individuals with genetically inherited disorders, uh, you know, very advanced types of epilepsy and all that may be characterized by 300 seizure episodes per week, all of a sudden becoming fully seizure free. Yep. And uh, we're starting to do some research to see what's happening at the genetic level. But certainly, uh, these receptor sites are having a very, very profound effect. Now, uh, the G protein coupled receptor site family has a, a, you know, hundreds of different uh, subtypes of receptors. Interestingly enough, the GPR3 has a very strong relationship with Alzheimer's, your GPR6, a strong relationship with Parkinson's. And interestingly enough, this one called GPR55, it's now becoming called the CB3 receptor for its tremendous significance. Um, Dr. Oren Davinsky, who's the great cannabis researcher from New York University Hospital, basically credits CBD's action on this GPR55 receptor as the reason that these seizure disorders are coming down so nicely in children with epilepsy. And certainly his research is pointing to that. Now, uh, beyond that, we have other families of receptors, uh, particularly these vanilloid pain receptors, widely expressed throughout the human body. And of course, we see anecdotally many patients utilizing cannabis, smoking cannabis, or utilizing THC or THC, CBD, or even CBD combinations to address pain. And certainly the fact that these vanilloid pain receptors are very accepting of these cannabinoids has a significant amount to do with it. Now, um, also your internal organs, um, your lungs, kidneys, and then of course your glands, your pituitary, hypothalamus, thymus, et cetera, adrenal glands, all have receptor sites for these cannabinoids. And basically this endogenous cannabinoid system is present from day 16 of gestation and it's intimately involved in the development of the central nervous system of the fetus. Wow, day 16, I didn't know that Dr. Titus. It's well, crazy. Really, uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. Now, here is a picture depiction of where you can find, mostly in the center, the midbrain. This is where you find your uh, CB1 receptors, and we're particularly excited about both the hippocampus as well as the amygdala areas, because these areas confer what we seem to have a, an effect, a stem cell-like effect of what we call neurogenesis, so the regeneration of new healthy brain cells, nerve and neurological pathways, which truly, if researched out, and this has been uh, certainly proven in laboratory rats, and if it does prove out in humans, well, this could potentially be the fountain of youth, because if you keep you know, regenerating new healthy nerve cells and brain cells, this is gonna have a tremendous effect on the muscular uh, side of the body, the skeletal side of the body, and certainly has tremendous anti-aging implications. Now, I'm telling uh, you, Dr. Titus, I feel like I've gotten younger in the last year. I'm just saying. Well, it, <laughs> it certainly is a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon that uh, people on CBD do uh, act, look, and feel uh, actually younger, like they're reversing the space-time continuum, interestingly enough. Um, so this slide, basically what I do is point out the area in the brain where we find the opioid receptors, because this is a, obviously a big uh, crisis going on uh, today, and there's a lot of legislation about opioids. Uh, and just to give a, a visualization, here on the back of the brain, what we call the brain stem, where you have the pons and the medulla oblongata, you also have these opioid receptors. Now, right in this very same area that's kind of circled in gold, you also have what we call the body's autonomic breathing reflex. And of course, we don't really think much about our breathing during the day. It just happens naturally. We go to sleep at night. We continue to breathe. And uh, this is a you know, physiological process that's characteristic of all humans. We all breathe. Uh, no matter whether we're children or elderly in a nursing home, we're all breathing. Uh, but it's interesting that patients who overdose on opioids, uh, the overdose, the receptor sites get hit to such a large degree in this particular area that many times it shuts off this autonomic breathing reflex. And so what happens is the patients just die of asphyxiation. 
-hmm. And it's a, a terrible crisis. But as you can remember from the previous slide, the cannabinoid receptors, the CB1 receptors, are in a different location of the brain, and thus no one has ever died from an overdose of natural botanical cannabis. Again, I mean, Dr. Titus, when you taught me that, when I learned that from you about that people are basically dying in their sleep from opioid overdose, and it's, you know, in your mind, you think, oh, someone is like on the street, like, overdosing but here it was people that are probably they say 80 for up to 80 percent are rightly prescribed medications and they're simply taking handfuls of them a day because that's what they've been directed to do and then they die in their sleep Seventy three thousand of them last year i mean that mm -hmm. freaks me out you know yeah, these are yeah. like the women that i'm sitting next to at bible study it's not like drug addicts yes and many have of course come into opioids just from the natural course of therapy. And just this right. next slide, I have a uh, you know, picture here. More than one third of the US adults were prescribed opioids in the year 2015. Wow. And many of the you know, post-surgery or uh, just a normal uh, pain control. And uh, just un unfortunately, uh, some people within just five days can get addicted. It's just a unfortunate uh, situation. And um, you know, certainly the next slide here, we basically show that opioid use is much lower in the U.S. cannabis-friendly states, and presumably because patients can combine larger amounts of cannabis with a lower, much safer dose of opioids, and certainly uh, this uh, trend is uh, one that is not being lost among uh, some of the uh, top uh, uh, you know, people and regulators, particularly the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Dr. Nora Volkow, very much now becoming a cannabis uh, proponent. Wow. Now, um, our next slide that uh, basically showed that uh, nice research from the University of New Mexico that uh, medical cannabis is effective at reducing the addiction tendencies of opioids, uh, interestingly enough. So um, uh, here they were looking at ways to reduce the um, uh, way that uh, the opioids would hit the opioid receptors. And even though um, your cannabinoid receptors are in different parts of the brain, there's an interesting phenomenon that CBD in particular is able to reduce the addictive tendencies. And I think the next slide will talk a little bit more about this, that uh, non-psychoactive cannabinoid CBD may uh, enable drug addiction recovery. A nice bit of research from the National Institute on drug abuse uh, showing in animal studies, certainly, this uh, phenomenon to be uh, very prevalent. Wow. And uh, you know, CBD use uh, has uh, shown to reduce the prescription drug use. So the average person starting a course of CBD therapy is on 2.8 pharmaceutical pills per day. And after uh, four months, they're down to 0 0.7 pills per day. So again, some very interesting statistics, some very interesting uh, dislocations uh, starting to happen uh, just because of uh, products now being more available. Right. Uh, certainly is a, a nice uh, article recently in uh, Newsweek about addiction, pain control, and uh, opioids. Uh, so this uh, particular uh, slide shows that uh, kind of the pain feedback loop uh, between certain parts of the frontal lobe of the brain, it's interesting to see that cannabinoids can interfere with this pain cycle. And uh, it does seem that the combination of THC and CBD is far superior to THC alone in terms of pain reduction. Wow. So uh, some interesting facts just about the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so just uh, interesting to note that the phenomena we know is the runner's high. When we're doing extreme exercise, like running a marathon, we were you know, in high school and the rest, uh, you know, certainly it's been many years for me, but uh, when we're doing this type of extreme exercise, uh, all of a sudden we're overcome with this beautiful bliss-like state and this uh, runner's high is really a, a release of the endogenous cannabinoid anandamide. And here, uh, basically there's such a release that it overcomes the normal tendency for enzymatic degradation. We have this beautiful bliss-like uh, feeling and it's just due to the internal cannabinoid called anandamide. Now, another interesting phenomenon that uh, mother's breast milk, of course, when moms become pregnant, their body chemistry changes. Again, the production of internal cannabinoids overcomes the tendency for enzymatic degradation. And the first food the mother feeds the child through the breast milk is, uh, it does contain significant quantities of internal endogenous uh, cannabinoids. I love that, because so I always say breastfeeding matters. Now I'm right. <laughs> you oh. are for sure, absolutely. <laughs> yes, really a uh, very, very interesting uh, phenomenon here. Um, now, uh, it, there's also some interesting research showing uh, that we uh, humans are, you know, since, again, cannabinoids have been 
kind of eradicated from our diets over the past three and a half generations. Uh, many of us are now uh, deficient in cannabinoids, and particularly Dr. Ethan Russo, a very famous cannabis uh, researcher, came up with this paper going back to 2003 about his experience with many patients who had things, uh, you know, very difficult to treat medical conditions, things such as fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, migraine headache, uh, types of uh, digestive disturbances, all were cannabinoid deficient. He started wow. giving his patients plant cannabinoids. Many of them overcame health challenges and uh, got to a much higher level of overall health and wellness. And certainly this uh, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency is now making its uh, rounds throughout the medical community. Certainly at some point we'll actually have an insurance billing diagnosis and special code for this, as well as hopefully uh, medicines to be able to treat this uh, condition here. And wow. uh, it's really something that uh, you know, we're, we're quite excited about uh, the fact that we might now have an answer. And uh, I think the next uh, couple of slides talk a little bit more about uh, some of this. Um, here's one uh, study showing that CBD is basically able to target the mitochondria of the cell. And certainly the mitochondria, the powerhouses of the cell mm -hmm. that produces your energy, your ATP energy reserves, et cetera. And generally the fatigue patients in particular report after taking CBD for three or four days, of, wow, I've got more energy. I feel like doing, you know, house chores or, uh, you know, mowing the yard or you know, just uh, things that they might not normally uh, do. And this uh, study really uh, points to that. And, uh, you know, further the study shows that uh, CBD is able to help regulate uh, certain uh, nutrients that come across the cell membrane. So CBD actually changes the shape, orientation, and the permeability of the cell membrane. Of course, wow. uh, the next slide, I talk a little bit more about mitochondria. Dr. McCullough has some wonderful uh, research on this showing that basically it produces about 90% of the energy generated in the human body. And certainly this is something that uh, uh, we're very excited that CBD does seem to have this direct effect on the mitochondria. And then you know, further, uh, clinical uh, endocannabinoid deficiency, the next uh, couple of slides talk about intestinal inflammation. Uh, some recent studies have been uh, looking at this uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And, uh, certainly uh, there's been some nice uh, research at University of Massachusetts Medical School showing that uh, this process of intestinal inflammation really deals quite a lot with uh, endogenous cannabinoids and cannabinoids that come from plant sources as well. And basically, if you're deficient in cannabinoids, you're not going to be able to check this process of intestinal inflammation. You really need these cannabinoids to help line the gut wall. I think the next slide wow. talks about that a little bit more, uh, but certainly this is a, a very a crucial process that uh, basically these uh, endocannabinoids are molecules that are necessary to relieve the intestinal inflammation. Of course, you know, inflammation being the root cause of all disease. Um, so this has another uh, very interesting application in terms of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. Again, if you're deficient in cannabinoids, you could potentially have a lot of these digestive disturbances. And uh, once you start to take plant cannabinoids, uh, we've had a tremendous amount of uh, patients, uh, things such as Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, et cetera, all these digestive disturbances, all of a sudden they start to come back to much higher levels of uh, health and wellness. Now, uh, further on this uh, endocannabinoid deficiency, we've actually seen research from Stanford University. And um, this one here uh, basically uh, talks that uh, the early onset of Alzheimer's and dementia is brought about by an endogenous cannabinoid deficiency that actually affects uh, the brain cells. And you can see the difference between a normal brain and an Alzheimer's type brain. Uh, certainly, we'd love to be able to take that diseased brain, start to move it back towards the more normal state. But this nice research that came out in, I believe, March of 2017, again, giving much more credence to this theory of clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. And Dr. Titus, you know, I've always said, I talked to my mom and dad who were in their, you know, late 70s. And then I said, how many people have like dementia and Alzheimer's when you were a kid? And they're like, we remember one person of the whole county that was like 92 that we'd kind of say is losing their mind. And the truth is, is like every single day I get phone calls from people in their 50s, 60s, 70s that have early onset dementia and Alzheimer's. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Don't you think? 
Well, certainly, yeah, the, the trend, I mean, if you look uh, nationally, uh, yes. And of course, when I was a kid, we didn't ever have any epilepsy. I didn't know of any epileptic children, uh, you know, autism. We didn't really have that. I know there was one child in a neighboring school that unfortunately had an automobile accident, had a brain injury. And uh, yeah, he was maybe a little deficient. But I mean, gosh, now today, every neighborhood, you've got three or four epileptic or autistic children. And uh, certainly, um, over time, the gene pool seems to be becoming a little bit weaker. And it'd right. be interesting to see two or three generations from now, all of a sudden, how people's health starts to improve, again, because now we have the ability to start to use cannabinoids in our diets. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, just on a recent uh, TV program, I was able to uh, you know, talk a little bit about this uh, clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. And again, I think the next slide just shows that, you know, patients who start to take plant cannabinoids move to this higher level of overall health and wellness, certainly right. Alzheimer's dementia. If we can start taking, you know, 50 to maybe even 100 milligrams of CBD daily, we think we can really make a dent in this uh, Alzheimer's dementia levels. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Now here, another uh, interesting concept in cannabis science. I talked about this a little bit earlier about what we call the entourage effect. Just all these 500 chemical compounds in the cannabis plant uh, do seem to produce this magnified or what we call an entourage uh, type of effect versus what you see with the pharmaceutically developed versions. So of course, in pharmaceuticals, you just take one or two active ingredients from plants mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, kind of synthesize those. And that's your formulation. And uh, we see some benefit from this. Uh, you know, certainly um, in terms of epidiolics, the new FDA approved version of CBD, certainly getting a nice uh, result with uh, patients with epileptic seizures well enough to have an FDA approval as a traditional pharmaceutical medication. But of course, here you have the traditional, you know, side effects of a pharmaceutically developed version. And it's interesting to note that our natural botanical version we're getting much greater results in some of our clinical studies in terms of average seizure reduction. And not only uh, that, we're seeing some great benefit in terms of quality of life improvements among many of these children. I've got some slides on that a little bit later on. But this entourage effect is a very interesting uh, phenomenon, just showing that many people get a much better effect from the natural plant compound than they do from the pharmaceutically developed uh, version as well. Hey, Dr. Titus, I just want to chime in here. I had a gal reach out to me that is actually on my team up here in North Dakota. Her little daughter had seizures and she just inboxed me like literally a day ago. And she said, thank you so much for bringing these products to North Dakota. My daughter's been seizure free for nine months and the med she was on, I can't remember. She said the name, the medication she was on, she wasn't even seizure free. And I was like, yes, that's so awesome. <laughs> um, what a great, and, you know, yeah, everybody's different, bodies are different, but I was like, that is such a testimony of CBD. It's just incredible, you know? It's been uh, great to see that. Yes, many of these children over time develop what we call refractory epilepsy, that the medicine that used to work, all of a sudden is not working any longer. The seizures keep coming back. And it's nice to see that CBD, these problem children, CBD is very much able to address that. Yeah. Um, this was uh, some interesting research. When I found about the U.S. government uh, patent here, the 6630507, oh, I was just totally amazed. Um, this research started in 1999, including a team, no, including Nobel Prize winning laureate, Dr. Julius Axelrod. This regards the therapeutic use of cannabinoids. So again, even though we had cannabis prohibition, the research side, the National Institutes of Health side of the U.S. government looking at the benefits here. And this uh, uh, patent, which was awarded October of 2003, is titled Cannabinoids as Antioxidants and Neuroprotectants. And here it shows a wide range of potential uh, therapeutic benefit, and particularly uh, that uh, the uh, non-psychoactive cannabinoids, uh, such as CBD, are very much more advantageous to use as they avoid the toxicity-related issues of your psychoactive cannabinoids. Wow. Um, so for example, uh, you know, two or three milligrams of THC, and I might be asleep for uh, eight or 10 hours, uh, but most mornings I take 50 milligrams of CBD, another 50 milligrams during the day, and 50 more at night, and I'm you know, awake, alert, cognizant, I can drive a car, handle uh, presentations, uh, do a, a full day as a CEO of a, a publicly traded company. So uh, that kind of gives you a relative idea about how these non-psychoactive cannabinoids may be advantageous. 
and then um, I think I can skip that slide and the next one uh, showing some of the antioxidant anti-inflammatory uh, capabilities. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, CBD is a much stronger antioxidant than vitamin C or vitamin E. Uh, certainly here, uh, some very interesting benefit for your autoimmune uh, conditions. Uh, I mean, uh, and then any inflammatory type condition, your heart disease, cardiovascular risk, your diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis patients. These are all uh, patients that fall into what we call metabolic syndrome. And even certain types of cancer are, the er are related to the errors of the human body's uh, uh, metabolistic processes. Very, very interesting that uh, these cannabinoids, particularly CBD, is going to be able to address these uh, maladies uh, very nicely. <clears throat> I mean, just think about how many problems are going to be solved. I'm so excited, I can't even stand it. <laughs> well, it's really uh, interesting. Yeah, so uh, many patients go into the doctor and they have their blood drawn, and you know, the doctor sees very you know elevated inflammatory levels. You know, if you're a diabetic, you've got very high A1C scores, or if you're um, you know got some heart disease or. Uh, other um, cardiovascular problems, you might have elevated interleukin levels, or you might have a, a very elevated uh, C-reactive protein level. And it's interesting that patients on CBD for six to eight weeks really show that these inflammatory levels start to come down to the more normal range. And the, even here, we've got uh, Dr. Nora Volkow, the Executive Director of National Institute on Drug Abuse, testifying in front of the U.S. Senate about some of the potential uh, benefits of CBD uh, therapeutically. No. Another uh, interesting bit of research here, uh, UCLA Medical Center in Torrance, uh, they looked at uh, 446 young adults who were unfortunately involved in automobile accidents where they suffered traumatic head injuries. And of course, you know, being young adults and in California, many of these um, uh, youngsters had the ability to use cannabis. And uh, the research here that was published in the American Surgeon shows that of the regular cannabis users, uh, these individuals were 80% more likely to survive a traumatic brain injury. And it's just presumably because their recreational use of cannabis had this interesting neuroprotective benefit around all the brain cells of the body. And that gave them a better ability to uh, withstand the traumatic uh, brain injuries. Wow. And, uh, certainly uh, from this, we look at all our, you know, up and coming athletes, our you know, potential uh, high school, college football players, or any of those sport athletes who are susceptible to head injury, uh, you know, women who are equestrian riders or field hockey mm -hmm. players, or even soccer players have uh, the you know, long-term effects that uh, can be seen. Obviously, CTE is becoming the industrial disease of the National Football League. Uh, we see it in the National Hockey League as well. And we really think at some point that CBD, is, since it's non-psychoactive, can likely be mandated that all the youngsters need to be uh, taking this. Now, uh, across the spectrum, uh, we've seen a tremendous increase in these neurological disorders over time. Uh, some of the research from the Mayo Clinic basically shows the statistics that for every 10 calendar years of life, uh, men of all ages have a 24% risk. So every 10 years, 24% greater risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And mm -hmm. certainly uh, this is a you know, wow. trend reported in the Mayo Clinic. I think the next slide talks about some of these other neurological disorders uh, being significantly on the rise as well. I've got links to some of the articles that show the statistics, but uh, you know, it's just an unfortunate uh, situation that um, you know, we have today exposure to things that we didn't have many generations ago. Like I'm not right. on the cell phone talking, but my body's acting as an antenna picking up on all these electro signals that are going on around me. Uh, we have environmental uh, neurotoxins, uh, agricultural chemicals such as pyroquat that's regularly uh, sprayed, winding up uh, in uh, brain cells of many people with Alzheimer's, uh, for example. Um, and of course, we have things such as artificial uh, sugars and uh, the rest, which are, again, proven neurotoxins. And it's interesting, before CBD, we didn't really have a way to protect our central nervous system. But now with some of the government research showing the neuroprotective benefits uh, we really seem to have a fighting chance to be able to help maintain our health in spite of all these environmental uh, factors. And uh, certainly this is uh, quite prevalent. Uh, some uh, interesting uh, study and research here basically showing that uh, in, in elderly people, uh, we see significant muscle loss. Uh, we have a you know, kind of a 
uh, slide here, just a uh, cutaway slide of a typical male, 23 years old. And you can see in his lower legs a significant amount of muscle mass, but by the time wow. they get to be 78, the deterioration, this is really because of the degeneration or deterioration of nerves. And uh, basically as these nerves die off, the signal starts to weaken, obviously, you don't get the signal to get the blood flow, circulation, the nutrients, etc. And this creates this uh, wasting condition. But uh, interestingly enough, if you can keep this nerve signal going and start to regenerate and improve these nerve cells, uh, even in elderly people in their 70s and 80s, we've seen tremendous gains in muscle mass. Uh, people who were pretty well sedentary, uh, you know, kind of wheelchair confined, all of a sudden getting up and uh, doing uh, house chores, uh, doing yard work, playing nine holes of golf. It's a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon. Keeping the nerves of the body healthy, uh, certainly we can uh, help uh, keep our muscular and skeletal systems uh, healthy well beyond our expected lifespan, we believe. I'm telling you, Dr. Titus, I think my muscles look better than ever at 41. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not saying that to brag. I'm like, something shifted in my body in the last year, and I'm like, I've been taking CBD for a year. Like, I swear to God, it's helped yeah. everything fire better or like, I don't know. It's, it's been incredible. And, and just the sleep alone, right? When you sleep better, I feel like your body heals better. So anyway. It, it certainly does. Yes. And it does make a difference for many folks. And uh, certainly uh, we're thrilled to see some uh, great benefit uh, with someone uh, like yourself, normally a healthy person without any real condition. But you know, if you take CBD prophylactically, just you know, your 50 milligrams a day, just to help support all of a sudden, very nice things happen over time. So uh, it, it's uh, quite an interesting uh, phenomenon. We'd like to do a, a long five-year study. They just had a five-year study on aspirin. Interesting that people who took one aspirin a day for five years and how at the end of that five-year period, their health compared to people who weren't taking aspirin. Sure. And the people taking an aspirin a day actually were in worse shape than the people who didn't. Wow. Did the same study with CBD and mm -hmm. show how over five years, people are actually healthier and their health is improved versus what happened with aspirin, I think it would be very uh, interesting. Okay, let me know when that study starts because I want to be in it, okay? <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, really uh, quite, uh, quite interesting about this. But anyway, uh, you know, our company uh, we've had a number of firsts. Uh, we've done uh, some great things. Uh, one of the big things, uh, able to legalize our products into the country of Brazil, uh, Mexico uh, over the past uh, few years and you know, formerly very anti-cannabis countries are now all of a sudden seeing the difference between hemp, marijuana, et cetera, and how CBD particularly can help uh, children with epileptic uh, seizure disorders. Uh, certainly this is uh, something that's been uh, great. We've been able to change the dialogue and uh, certainly uh, over time we've developed uh, some uh, very interesting products. Of course, many people in the US are regularly drug tested and this moves into the next slide about world anti-doping uh, because we had to develop a special product to get into the Mexico markets. And we had to remove all the THC from our products. Uh, some of our products do contain trace amounts of THC, again, to the point where someone, you know, trying to take our product and get healthy, well, if they're drug tested, if they're a government employee or a truck driver, you know, they might fail a drug test. So what we did was develop a fully 100% THC free product that was accepted in the country of Mexico as of February 2016. And this was actually picked up on by the World Anti-Doping Agency because they thought CBD as long as it didn't contain THC, would be perfectly legal for professional sport and Olympic competition. And sure enough, they've given CBD the thumbs up. So uh, this has been something we're very excited about, getting our product actually registered with the World Anti-Doping Association so it can be uh, utilized throughout the professional sport and Olympic uh, competition. But all the products we sell in Europe are fully uh, THC free, and uh, certainly uh, people are responding very, very nicely to it. Absolutely. Now, some other applications, uh, Dr. Don Abrams is uh, Chief of uh, Oncology at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. Uh, generally, post-chemotherapy, he's recommending medical cannabis to his patients because they all have things such as pain, depression, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, sleep issues. And of course, he can prescribe six different medicines with all kinds of differing side effects or he can just prescribe medical cannabis. Now, since he's been uh, alerted to CBD, certainly he's been uh, a very big proponent and has been uh, prescribing uh, this uh, uh, CBD to a lot of his post-chemotherapy patients. We're very excited about entering into some clinical research on post-chemotherapy rehab with CBD. I think our next slide talks to that perhaps a little bit. 
and uh, certainly uh, we have a couple of interesting products, as well as detox bath soap that seem to work very well in combination with this. Wow. Now the next slide just talks about all the great research going on around the globe in terms of CBD, obviously here in the US, epilepsy, uh, metabolic syndrome, great research going on in Israel, rare bone disorders, broken bones, osteoporosis, again, great research in Israel, two very young up and coming uh, pharmaceutical startup companies here in the US looking at these conditions. Uh, Parkinson's, uh, we're involved in a study in Brazil at the moment regarding CBD and Parkinson's. Alzheimer's out here in San Diego, Dr. David Schubert showing some great research on cannabinoids to address uh, Alzheimer's disease. There's also some very interesting early stage Petri dish model uh, research on cancer. And then one of our pharmaceutical partners looking at neuroprotection and the traumatic head injury with CBD. Of course, recently the FDA has approved Epidiolex, the pharmaceutically developed version of CBD. This is obviously a big step uh, forward. We think this is gonna significantly open the doors to further ongoing uh, research as uh, time goes along. And uh, certainly uh, this is gonna have a great impact on the overall CBD market because not only now do we have a nutraceutical product, I think the next slide talks about this a little bit. We have a nutraceutical, but also a pharmaceutical uh, product as well, and uh, certainly we're following the nice trends that uh, people are starting to see some of the great health and wellness benefits, and they're uh, deciding to spend money, cash out of pocket to buy uh, various uh, CBD products. Right. Now, uh, these are a couple of our studies that have been done in Mexico regarding <clears throat> the uh, type of epileptic seizure disorder that was studied by the pharmaceutical company, Epidiolex. And I have our slides on the left in blue and Epidiolex on the black side over on the right. And the first thing you can see is we're giving much lower doses of CBD to these young children. Again, we have a natural botanical product with all these entourage botanicals, so we don't need to give as much product. And certainly what we're seeing in these studies is almost a doubling of the, um, you know, the amount of the uh, you know, seizures that are being controlled. So the pharmaceutical side reporting 36.5% average reduction in motor seizures, very technically on our side, about a 67% reduction. I mean, Dr. Titus, that's, that, this is an incredible slide right here because you look at that Epidiolex, what is it, like $37,000 a year or something like that I read? Right, right. It was more than that, I don't even know, but I thought, it's like, you know, people get on CBD, they're not paying $37,000 a year. I mean, they might be paying like, you know, $200 a month or $250 a month if they are on, you know, like our premium product. But the truth is, is like, it's incredible to me to see that slide right there, knowing what the natural botanical does versus like the chemically altered, right? right. And again, you can see the lower dosing. Uh, of course, you don't need as much product because it's got higher energetics in it, if you will, and hits the receptor sites to a much better degree. So it's interesting, the next slide actually shows some of these uh, amazing quality of life benefits. And uh, not only uh, do we not really see much of this being reported on the pharmaceutical side, but here with a natural botanical product, uh, parents by and large are reporting that not only the children overcoming their epilepsy and seizure disorders, but also that after a little bit of time on the product, gosh, their mood, their emotion, their cognition, their social interaction has improved, as well as their sleep and uh, feeding. And then we don't see any adverse side effects like we do with the pharmaceutically developed side. So certainly uh, very interesting, some of these uh, quality of life improvements that we're um, uh, seeing with our studies and research. Um, wow. Really um, quite impressed with uh, some of what we're seeing. This is just another study kind of mirroring uh, exactly what we showed in the previous slide. I think a little bit better uh, you know, 86% average reduction in motor seizures. Uh, some of these children had seizures right from outset, had you know, all kind of brain surgeries. And I think 17% uh, have uh, finally reported that uh, all seizures, 100% of the seizures have been eliminated over a four month period of time. So you know, again, very difficult patient population and uh, seeing some uh, fabulous uh, benefit and results. Wow. And again, the quality of life improvements as well. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Next slide, I talk a little bit more about these synthetic cannabinoids and uh, basically uh, that uh, the Epidiolex has a um, warning on the prescribing information just because uh, uh, any type of synthetic uh, cannabinoid uh, has an effect on certain liver enzymes, particularly ALT and AST. Um, so the Epidiolex prescribing uh, will have a risk for these 
elevated liver enzyme levels, and certainly we don't see this with a natural botanical product. In fact, the natural botanical product helps the, the liver. Right. The That's a big question I get a lot of times is like with CBD and liver, people that have high liver enzymes, they're like, is CBD going to affect that? Is it going to help it? Is it going to hurt it? That's a, that's a common question I get. It is. And uh, certainly over time, we've seen uh, these uh, elevated liver enzyme levels, particularly uh, ALT, AST, start to come down to the more normal ranges. It's, it's been uh, phenomenal. In fact, one of our pharmaceutical partners has a license agreement from the NIH to develop a cannabinoid-based medicine to treat a liver a related disorder called hepatic encephalopathy. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So this slide uh, talks about uh, some of the developments we've made. We've now actually sourced CBD from a non-cannabis source. So this, uh, from Can I interrupt for just for a second? I want to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Bree, do you know if Kevin Kramer's son died from hepatic encephalopathy? His one son that passed away? Um, I'm not sure what condition, but it did have to do with liver and kidney failure. Yeah, he was, I thought, part of me thinks it might have been that. And when Agreed. Dr. Titus just said that, I was like, oh my gosh, I should talk, talk to Chris about that. Like, anyway, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do, this, this Kevin Kramer, our senator that Bree is representing, is his, he actually had a son pass away fairly recently, like in the last mm -hmm. eight months here um, that died of something liver related. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I think he was an alcoholic maybe or, or something mm -hmm. happened with that. And, and so they... He had some problems, complications, and ended up passing, which was super sad. Um, but anyway, when I hear that, I'm like, wow, there's hope maybe, you know? For sure, for sure, yeah. And we're quite excited about uh, some of the um, ongoing uh, research in terms of liver health and liver regeneration. Yeah. Uh, so this slide talks about a new product that we've developed, uh, which is a non-cannabis source of CBD. Actually, we've been able to source this from the humulus plant. There's a type of humulus that uh, grows in the um, uh, Northeastern India, southeastern, uh, southwestern China, that uh, actually uh, does contain cannabinoids. We've been able to source this, and so now we're fully cannabis-free, if you will, which is helping us with some of our dialogue in European and the Latin American countries. Um, this is a, a wonderful product. We're very excited about it, and uh, certainly uh, thrilled to be uh, bringing this to U.S. and world markets. Most people know of what's called humulus lupulus, uh, which is uh, what's uh, used to brew beer beer hops, if you will. And this is a different type of humulus, uh, it's called humulus yunnanensis, uh, comes from uh, the Yunnan province of uh, China and that uh, region where um, cannabinoids are very uh, present. We've been able to specially grow this type of uh, plant. So um, uh, from that, we really get into uh, some of these uh, interesting international opportunities that are uh, developing. Uh, um, certainly, uh, there's a tremendous interest around the globe in CBD and, of course, in cannabis. Uh, the World Health Organization, as I mentioned earlier, um, saying uh, CBD will not be a scheduled drug and they'll be voting uh, coming up in March of 2019 to remove uh -huh. cannabis fully from the United Nations Single Convention Treaties on Narcotics. That's and awesome. We're excited about participating in that uh, dialogue. Uh, Canada has just uh, legalized the recreational use uh, of uh, cannabis on October 17th. Uh, certainly, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau has been uh, very uh, <clears throat> prevalent in wanting to get this uh, done in Canada. And um, the next slide talks about the Sun Life uh, Financial, which is a big insurance um, service, and they cover about 6 million Canadians. And they will uh, cover for insurance reimbursement anyone with a doctor's uh, prescription or recommendation for cannabis. So certainly, wow! That, I didn't really know that happened. That's huge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, huge when trend. Is, when, is, when is the U.S. going to get on board? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the day is coming. There are you know, certainly uh, insurance uh, carriers looking at this and uh, wow. people are demanding it. So yeah. it's uh, quite something. And then, of course, in Canada, there's been a tremendous growth in cannabis uh, financing, a lot of capital being raised, uh, uh, money going into these uh, Canadian uh, licensed producers. You can see the tremendous improvement in the deal sizes and uh, wow. the rest of the past little bit. Uh, we actually, the next slide shows that uh, $8 billion dollars have been uh, raised in the Canadian markets uh, just uh, throughout October of this year, probably by the end of the year, some of the deal sizes will top uh, 10 billion. Uh, wow. Tremendous amount of financing, a lot of uh, very large uh, institutions, uh, you know, uh, people who normally would not be uh, cannabis investors uh, are now starting to invest in Canada because all of a sudden it's legal at the federal level and thus these uh, large uh, institutional investors are now able to play in these federally legal markets. We hope something will happen at the U.S. 
uh, to allow us to better compete. But certainly uh, around the globe, we're seeing even in Germany now, where medical cannabis is legal, uh, about 25,000 patients are now covered by insurance for their doctor recommendation and doctor prescriptions for medical cannabis. Certainly, that's wow. one of the very largest uh, CBD markets. Now, our neighbor to the south, uh, Mexico, has elected a new president, just taken office on uh, December 1st. Uh, president Obrador uh, is a very pro-cannabis individual. Uh, we think there are going to be uh, some market changes. It's certainly going to allow us to expand our presence uh, within the country in terms of CBD and CBD research. So we're uh, quite excited uh, for that. And then uh, the next slide, I think, talks about the uh, UK. The uh, Drug Policy Committee uh, earlier this summer called for marijuana legalization, and then that was uh, followed up with actually uh, the legalization of medical cannabis within the U.S., uh, within the U.K. So doctor prescriptions, again, now for medical cannabis uh, legal throughout the country, and uh, they're working on insurance reimbursement uh, there as well. Uh, Georgia, the first uh, country in the former Soviet Republic, has actually legalized uh, cannabis consumption. So again, these trends are happening uh, throughout the globe, and uh, certainly we're excited to be part of the dialogue here. Yeah. Uh, one of the large uh, cannabis uh, producers in Canada, Canopy Growth uh, Corporation, their CEO, Bruce Linton, basically says the future of cannabis is really in products. And we're seeing a tremendous trend, uh, even in Colorado, away from the traditional uh, smoking of the cannabis joint or the cigarette into things such as oils, tinctures, topical preparations, uh, everything from uh, you know sleep aids, et cetera. And uh, this uh, trend in these advanced, more medical looking, uh, more socially acceptable uh, type products is certainly uh, one that's uh, quite uh, popular. The edibles market, the cannabis edibles, represents about 70% of the overall cannabis market. Wow. And we're also seeing uh, many of these cannabis licensed uh, producers uh, helping uh, the research communities uh, throughout the globe. Here in San Diego, UC of San Diego has partnered with uh, Tilray uh, to um, start uh, clinical research on the pre-Parkinson's condition called essential tremor. They'll be enrolling patients uh, starting in January for this study, and uh, Tilray will be supplying UC San Diego researchers with a combination THC CBD product that uh, certainly we're excited to follow this. It's right in our backyard here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> South Africa has also uh, recently uh, stepped into the forefront by legalizing uh, cannabis use, and uh, we're quite excited that this is a new continent, obviously another uh, great continent and opportunities for uh, CBD to potentially uh, move forward there. Right. And uh, in Europe, as I mentioned, we have a very significant presence. Uh, we're actually outselling in Europe what we're doing here in the U.S., and uh, recently the European Parliament has been working to legalize cannabis, the medical use of cannabis uh, throughout the EU. So I think you'll see uh, something uh, coming forth in uh, the first uh, few months of uh, 2019 towards this front, but certainly discussions and negotiations are underway. And uh, this was a nice study done at University of Mexico. We had a lot of uh, you know, cell phone app uh, type of uh, patients, about 100,000 patients who were involved in medical cannabis research, uh, basically just Every time they had a positive experience, uh, basically uh, were able to use their app and report their experience. And certainly uh, the researchers are basically uh, showing that this uh, has a, a profound effect. I mean, uh, the, the trend here where we're seeing dislocations from people using traditional pharmaceutical medications, switching over to cannabis and CBD therapies uh, certainly uh, is going to have a big impact on the future of pharmaceutical uh, medicines. And many of these large drug and alcohol companies, uh, the next slide will even show this, are seeing a you know, drop in, in market share. Not only are we seeing a shift away from traditional pharmaceutical medications, but also in Colorado, uh, beer sales and alcohol sales are down about 15%. And wow. interestingly enough, many of the uh, big uh, you know, beer and alcohol companies are now partnering with Canadian licensed producers to produce an alcohol-free kind of beer, if you will, but it'll contain a small amount, two or three milligrams of THC, and thus will give you the equivalent buzz, if you will, by uh, taking a, a cannabis-based uh, product. Now, uh, of course, cannabis has been shown to be about 114 times safer than alcohol. You know, the long-term effects of alcohol use and abuse, obviously the you know, liver 
disorders, liver transplants and uh, the mm-hmm. rest, but you don't have that with uh, cannabis. And so many people, I think when it comes to a THC adult beverage, if this was available on markets, uh, you'd see a significant change from alcohol to something that's a little bit uh, safer and without the you know hangover type effect that you get with, uh, can- with uh, alcohol. Wow. And a nice uh, study from Consumer Reports, uh, basically looking at <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Individuals here in the U.S. Um, about a uh, thousand individuals were surveyed. Of this, uh, 13% of the uh, American adults uh, said they'd use CBD to treat uh, health-related issues. And of those people using CBD, 90% had said it helped them. Um, no. So this is a you know, fantastic trend. But it's also interesting to note that Consumer Reports mentioned that people found out about CBD from other friends, family, or the internet, not necessarily from their physicians yet. Right. And of course, we're looking to do medical cannabis symposiums for these doctors so they can learn uh, the science, but also the dosing that we've been able to establish about some of the products and hopefully be able to um, uh, you know, help them with their interaction with uh, patients. Um, just more about the alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceutical companies uh, losing market share to cannabis and uh, some of the more progressive um, <clears throat> alcohol, tobacco, and even pharmaceutical companies are now looking to partner in with the uh, cannabis side of uh, the world. And uh, certainly this is creating uh, tremendous um, opportunities. Absolutely. Now, uh, of course, the Canadians have been raising all kind of money uh, in terms of um, international uh, involvement in their uh, business enterprises. And uh, relative to the U.S., uh, many of our assets here are what we call undervalued on a relative basis. So a lot of these very large Canadian operations are now selectively purchasing uh, various U.S. cannabis assets. Uh, Many states have uh, uh, authorized uh, groups to grow cannabis. Uh, Some have authorized the distribution of cannabis. And many of these Canadians are actually buying these assets or partnering in. And certainly this is a, a very significant trend that's happening and you know, again, we have links to some of the uh, companies that are purchasing and some of the purchases. I mean, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of capital now starting to flow back into U.S. Uh, cannabis-based uh, companies. Wow. And, uh, that's a you know, real significant trend. So uh, just in conclusion, uh, we're actually seeing that uh, throughout the U.S., the herbal supplement sales are breaking all records. Uh, you know, we sold last year over $8 billion worth of herbal supplements, uh, the strongest sales growth in the U.S., uh, certainly uh, for uh, the first time eclipsing this $8 billion uh, figure. And uh, certainly many people are looking at more natural uh, health-oriented alternatives to uh, you know, things that uh, you know, they found that pharmaceuticals might work for a little bit, but then the negative long-term consequences are just, you know, things that they're uh, looking for alternatives and uh, cannabis really seems to fit uh, the bill for many people. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> hemp, of course, with the legalization here, we believe 60 million acres of U.S. farmland could be planted with hemp. It's a fantastic rotational crop and certainly, uh, you know, multi-billion dollar industries to develop from all the industrial uses, including the therapeutic side of CBD. We're really excited about that. Um, Colorado, we've recently seen a cannabis sales. Uh, again, another uh, record, well over $1.5 billion worth of cannabis will be sold this year. Uh, it's generated already this year over $200 million in tax revenue. By the time the end of the year comes around, it'll probably be $300 million will be the, t- the final figure. And uh, certainly this has got a uh, great benefit for uh, state treasurers, et cetera. And uh, I'm, I'm quite excited that- uh, Well, and look at the demographic that's increasing there, Dr. Titus, women and seniors over the age of 65, right? I mean- Very, very interesting to see this. Uh, you yeah. know, of course, uh, uh, you know, many people are now saying, well, this is not the worst thing in the world. The Colorado experiments have gone very well. And uh, of course, many seniors have health challenges that uh, you know, they're finding great benefit with the medical cannabis. <clears throat> Uh, This next slide is a very interesting uh, uh, slide. Uh, 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 CEO of one of the publicly traded cannabis companies uh, basically wrote a letter, a big full page ad in the Wall Street Journal, a Dear Mr. President letter, uh, basically showing that uh, the Canadians are well outpacing us because all the investment has been going into Canada because they have a legal framework at the federal level for medical cannabis. And without this framework, we here in the U.S. and the cannabis industry can't really effectively compete. And certainly 
uh, in terms of job creation, et cetera, we really think that uh, uh, you know, if America could compete on an equal footing level with what's going on in Canada, uh, we could uh, you know, employ a tremendous amount of individuals. We see well over a million individuals can be uh, employed in this cannabis, hemp, and CBD industry, and certainly uh, generate tremendous amount of tax revenue, not only for the states, but also the federal government. So gosh, it's time for us to really uh, come along and uh, you know, step up to the plate. And I think- uh, That was a genius idea because Trump is so competitive he's not going to let Canada win. <laughs> so that was a genius marketing strategy. Well, I, I really part. was uh, quite impressed with that. And certainly uh, we've also seen a couple of, um, you know, well-placed uh, <clears throat> congressional representatives who've been uh, very strong cannabis proponents over the years uh, do seem to have uh, been making hints to various press and news media outlets that uh, federal uh, legislation, cannabis reform could come very soon, hopefully in the first quarter of 2019. Wow. Uh, Dana Rohrbacher, very strong cannabis proponent from uh, California, uh, basically uh, talking to some people inside the White House that potentially the president's been talking about legalizing the medical use of cannabis. And certainly this would be uh, quite exciting. <clears throat> Gosh. Doesn't that make you wonder what would be happening with Medical Marijuana Inc. then, Dr. Titus? That makes me start well, just thinking like that. For sure, for sure. We're certainly excited about uh, the future and, uh, you know, we have a lot of good investor interest in our uh, company, but, uh, you know, there's been a lot of challenges along the way, certainly being pioneers mm -hmm. in the cannabis industry. Uh, you know, still today, we have very difficult challenges just in terms of banking, in terms of social acceptance. You see what's happening with Renita getting all these threats in North mm -hmm. Dakota for selling uh, CBD products. My gosh, but uh, uh, we really think uh, what Albert Einstein said, all these great spirits have encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. And uh, certainly over time, we'd like to think that we can uh, prevail and win the day. But uh, uh, certainly these trends are happening not only in the U.S., but around the world. And, uh, you know, we certainly look forward to uh, more education, more dialogue, and uh, working with our legislators to help, uh, you know, uh, allow some of these uh, products that do seem to support health and wellness and to do so in a very safe and effective manner. Yeah, you can say that again. Wow, I love that presentation. <laughs> that was Bree, great. Yes. Do you have any questions, Bree? Oh, wow. Thank you so much, first of all. That was excellent. Yes. Um, uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you know, obviously, the education is uh, paramount. There's a lot happening uh, around the globe, a lot happening in the research side. Um, you know, trying to keep it all straight and keep it into one presentation. Uh, just, uh, but, you know, it's remarkable the uh, the trends and uh, you know, we're very excited about uh, so many potential applications. Again, the tremendous receptor network in the endogenous cannabinoid system um, you know, is kind of why uh, it seems CBD is working so well for so many people. It just, you know, again, you know, some people just have some neurological disorders and CBD seems to be you know, not only helping uh, with the neurodegeneration, but also neurogenesis, the regeneration of new healthy nerve and neural pathways. And then, you know, uh, others who have autoimmune conditions or uh, other inflammatory conditions, CBD seems to be helping there. Again, a tremendous receptor network, and it only stands to reason if you look at this huge receptor network that, yeah, cannabinoids can certainly move us to a much higher level of health and wellness, particularly since we're all cannabinoid deficient. And right. uh, not only a benefit there, but also benefits for our dogs, horses, fish, cattle, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, my Zoe, she doesn't lick her legs all night. And I don't know if that was anxiety or pain, but she is out like a light, that little girl. And she's, she's going to be 13. And I mean, no more leg licking. I mean, it was like years of hours and hours every night. It would drive me nuts, kind of, you know, but you love your, you love your pets. <laughs> it's just been a total blessing. It's the whole thing has been a total blessing from people to pets to I mean, all of it financially, it's just been a total blessing. So Dr. Titus, you're such a blessing to everybody. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Yeah. You're awesome. So <laughs> smart. And you just know what, it, like where it's going, what's happening. You're just in the know with it. Bree, well, you certainly. have this slideshow. I can share this entire slideshow with you if it's something that you want to have. Yeah, um, like that. And that way, if there's anything you want to do with it. And I did record today's um, meeting and I can also get that, that to you if that's something you're interested in sharing with anybody that okay. is in the realm of wanting to know these these they want their questions answered or they want to yeah. know you know so there's a lot of confusion and fear so yeah. I've never been scared Dr. Titus when they told me they were going to come get me I'm like get the Facebook live phone charged up I'm going to be Facebooking live the whole way to jail and I'm going to get about a 10,000 more people on CBD let's go <laughs> so, 
<laughs> well, it's uh, very interesting. Sometimes a little controversy uh, helps the news and press to uh, start yes. to tell our story. And mm -hmm. uh, we certainly found that quite a lot. But, uh, you know, it's just something that uh, we have these challenges and hopefully uh, we'll be able to you know, uh, look back and say, gosh, we really were pioneers many, many years mm -hmm. from now. Right. So, Bree, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, one question I had is, um, obviously, you kind of understand your product and the, and the manufacturing in that um, essence, but I'm just wondering within the, the regulatory realm, how a consumer um, can ensure that, that the product that they are purchasing is pure and the concentration is what it says it is on the bottle, um, like the, the quantitative analysis aspect, just because it isn't regulated typically under the FDA. Um, if you can speak to that at all. I know that's one concern that I've had um, people approach me about previously. Yes, for sure. And this uh, certainly is a concern uh, uh, throughout the uh, overall cannabis uh, industry. Uh, we you know, certainly uh, are uh, looking to uh, improve the quality of products all the time. I think our company was the first to be what we call triple lab tested. Uh, we mm -hmm. tested three different stages throughout the entire process. But uh, what we've done as an industry uh, is get together. We have a group now called the Hemp Roundtable. Um, this is uh, uh, just a consortium of all of us within the uh, CBD industry, the larger and uh, more major producers have uh, uh, got this uh, nice group. It's headed by a law firm out of Lexington, Kentucky called Frost, Brown and Todd. And uh, what they're doing is actually establishing national testing standards for CBD based products. And so uh, coming up in uh, January of 2019, um, all those who have submitted products for testing will have a stamp. A U.S. Health or U.S. Hemp Authority will wow. certify that these products have all been tested and that their label claims have been met or exceeded. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, there was an interesting uh, publication by the uh, FDA subsidiary. I think it was in the Journal of Regulatory Science, it was, and they looked at all the various CBD products on the marketplace. And uh, of 25 different manufacturers, only two met or exceeded label claims. And, wow. uh, for example, if we said we had 17% CBD in one of our formulas, well, actually, we had 17.4%. Mm. And so we were one of two manufacturers who had passed this uh, Journal of Regulatory Science uh, inquiry. And wow. Certainly, we've been uh, impressed with that over time. Of course, our products, we've had clinical study and research in countries such as Mexico and Brazil, but mm -hmm. um, you know, our products all uh, can come with or uh, consumers can request what we call a certificate of analysis, just a laboratory um, review of the cannabinoid content and all your other cannabinoids and then a review of all uh, types of uh, any residual toxins or solvents, et cetera. And uh, these reports are regularly available, but uh, certainly the U.S. Hemp Authority, that's a certificate of uh, standards, I think is going to be something that we're trying to regulate within the industry mm -hmm. before that regulation is forced upon us by the FDA or other outside agencies who don't really know the industry. So we're taking a proactive stance to actually self-regulate ahead of the curve. If you and tell me when that's occurring. So that uh, will start, the process will, the application process starts January of 2019. Oh my so gosh, this is going to be great. February or March, we'll have our products, will actually have this U.S. Hemp Authority stamp or seal of excellence. This is so dynamite. This is news to me. I love it. Good oh, job. Good, good stuff job. we're doing behind the scenes. Yeah, just, just a couple <laughs> things, you know. <laughs> yeah, because that's, uh, Brie, you're absolutely right. That's a concern in the marketplace. Um, we've got tons of people that I talk to daily, weekly, and they come over and they're like, I bought this on the web. Um, you know, the product labels misspelled. There's 17 ingredients. I'm like, honestly, I don't know how much CBD is in here. I, right. I don't know the quality, you know, and that's just something that is the scary part, right? Because it is the wild, wild west. You don't know what people are getting, but I always say with, you know, with Canaway, with Medical Marijuana Inc., with the, with the standard and quality of our products, you know exactly what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, I mean, cream rises to the top. Everything else, it's like, it's almost scary to think about that people are consuming some of these products because what if it is loaded with THC and it's inappropriately labeled and all of a sudden they lose their job at the railroad or something. So mm -hmm. I love our standard of control and quality, Dr. Titus. So thank you for doing that, but that stamp's going to be awesome. Sure. Well, we're very excited about it. 
Excellent. And then just real quickly, the only other thing I have um, within the farm bill, you, you mentioned it previously. And um, so should that pass and be signed into law and um, hemp being removed from the controlled substances, number one um, regulation, um, how will that impact your industry? Well, I think uh, this, again, going to not legalize uh, the agricultural use or the you know, mm -hmm. ability of farmers to grow hemp here in the U.S. as a normal agricultural crop, but it's also going to legalize the derivatives from hemp, which includes okay. CBD. Thus, we will uh, have much greater access to things such as banking mm -hmm. um, and be able to do merchant processing and banking in a very much more efficient manner. Uh, currently, we have a you know, very long roundabout network. Um, you know, generally, our merchant processing runs us anywhere from 10 to 12 percent. Now, most businesses, you know, they're paying one and a half, two, maybe two and a quarter percent for their merchant processing. Mm -hmm. um, so we're already at a you know very significant disadvantage just um, right. having to go through all these you know roundabout, and of course, they consider us a high risk. Uh, company and you know even though my gosh this year we're probably going to you know, approach 70 million U.S. dollars in terms of our overall sales, uh, we're still considered a very high risk uh, company, and I think this is going to take a lot of that risk out, allow us to compete much more on an even basis with other industries who you know normally give their employees a paycheck every uh, week or every two weeks. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully be able to do that to a much easier extent. Uh, than we currently do right at the moment. Wow. Okay, great. Yeah, so it will definitely be a, a big uh, game changer for us. And obviously, uh, if hemp is going to be legal here in the U.S., then many other foreign countries are going to move forward uh, similarly and probably uh, exclude all kind of hemp products from their single convention treaty on narcotics mm -hmm. that they've all signed. And uh, I think this is going to really help the overall world um, in terms of the acceptance of CBD, all of a sudden we'll be able to export to many uh, Latin American and European countries, which still the borders are closed to allowing our CBD products in at the moment. Hey, Dr. Titus, what's that going to do for Canada is what I'm wondering, because I've talked to some Canadians and they said it's not the Canadian um, border, it's the U.S. border that is the problem. Well, yes, and in, in, in Canada, what uh, Canada has wanted to do um, is allow for all cannabis products, whether it's THC or CBD, to be sourced from Canadian operations. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to work on the ability to internationally export and import because I think in the US we'll be able to grow uh, certain types of CBD with various what we call entourage botanicals that they won't necessarily to be able to grow in Canada and then potentially vice versa. And I think over time, this international trade will start to develop. But currently, you know, Canada is kind of closed in that, again, all the cannabis, any type of a cannabis or hemp product has to be derived from in-country sources. Yep. So that's how they're trying to, you know, close their borders a little bit. But uh, I think they'll uh, change because... Well, we just got to grow a stronger, better quality that is doing so much more. And then they're going to be like, I guess we want you. Yep, Very we right. thought you would. Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, we won't be able to deny. Uh, once we get through and say if we were to develop a special product that just treats diabetes, you know, right. a combination of cannabinoids and terpenoids and all that. We go through uh, the FDA as a botanical drug and get a botanical designation and we can make that particular claim. Well, gosh, the doctors and patients in Canada are going to want it. And so uh, certainly it's going to, uh, you know, help to you know, break down these uh, current barriers that uh, Canada is putting up for not allowing the import of any cannabis product into their country. Yeah. Wow. That's great education. I didn't know all that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great. Well, terrific pleasure. Thank you so much for your interest. I certainly appreciate your time and uh, spending with me today. And uh, hopefully uh, we can help uh, raise the dialogue and certainly let you know a little bit more about uh, Renita and her group are doing in uh, North Dakota. Yeah, yeah I'm actually going to share this video with Chris Kramer, too, to say, hey, Brie was on. And because um, I know Chris is really uh, intrigued with all of it as well for for their family members and people that they know. I mean, we all know somebody that can benefit from nourishing their endocannabinoid system, right? So yeah, let's do it. Good. All right, well, I appreciate you, Dr. Titus, Bree. It was awesome uh, getting to know you here today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look forward to any future conversations or questions you might have where myself or Dr. Titus or 
any member of our organization can help out with uh, answering that. So perfect. Excellent. I appreciate it. Thank you for the wise counsel and the expertise. Thank you. You guys have a great weekend. Mm -hmm. All Thanks right. You do the same. Time. Take care. All Thanks. Right. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Uh, let's see here.